I've often been quoted as saying I would rather be governed by the first 2,000 people in the Boston Telephone Directory than by the 2,000 people on the faculty of Harvard University. In this present crisis, government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. They share our beliefs, our convictions, our hopes, and our dreams. These are the conservatives of the heart. They are our people. Join the best in the movement. It's Conservative Conversations with ISI, educating for liberty since 1953. Welcome back. You're listening to Conservative Conversations with Marlo and James. Today, we are joined by the Executive Director of the Ashbrook Center, Jeff Sikinga. Jeff, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Jeff, for our listener question today, Christina asks, for new readers to Edmund Burke, what do you suggest is a good starting point? Do you have an opinion on that one? Wow, that's a great question. I actually did my undergraduate thesis on Edmund Burke and his American followers. Oh, there you Um, go. So there's so much um, Burke. You know, as of course, his most famous, Burke's most famous work is Reflections on the Revolution in France. His early work is a really interesting one. It's probably not the best place to start, an essay on the sublime and the beautiful, uh, which is a really interesting philosophical meditation, especially for people who are interested in art and aesthetics and sort of the muses more broadly. Russell Kirk's The Conservative Mind is a great introduction to Burke and what Russell Kirk has written and, you know, sort of principles of of conservatism. He's taking those, as he himself says, straight from Burke in many ways, who he calls the father of modern conservatism. So I think Russell Kirk's introduction to Edmund Burke's a great place in the secondary literature. Um, But I think it's really hard to beat reflections on the revolution in France. It's a long, longer work, of course, but it's really, it's philosophical, but it's also polemical. So it's got that great, it's really political in a good way. I was going to answer with Burke's Reflections just because it's such a seminal text, but I also, I'm, I'm glad you answered with the, um, with his text, uh, Philosophical Inquiry into the Origin of Our Ideas of the Sublime and Beautiful, especially for, I highly recommend it for anyone like me that's interested in, you know, kind of the Scrutonian um, emphasis on art and, you know, literature and aesthetics. Um, and he makes some, you know, really interesting um, observations about, and how he de- just defines the sublime, how it's, you know, the most power, what makes the most powerful aesthetic experience and how it's akin to this astonishment in some instances is the sense of, it's a sense of terror. So just the way that he describes what characterizes it and he goes into architecture and, you know, just speaks about uh, some of these things that if you are a modern or if you're a contemporary, um, if you're a student that's interested in contemporary art, especially, and you've read Scruton's, um, Scruton's like works on that, I think that's a great launch pad into Burke. Yeah. Um, yeah, I agree. The Reflections is is a really great book. And, you know, in addition to what Kirk writes about um, Burke and the conservative mind, there's also a book that ISI um, uh, published a number of years ago called uh, Edmund Burke, A Genius Rediscovered, which is Kirk's sort of um, expanded version of his comments on Burke, which is, uh, that was my introduction to Burke. And I really loved that. Um, but yeah, you know, I'm interested who were the followers of Burke, the American followers of Burke that you focused on in your undergraduate thesis? Uh, Russell Kirk and George Will. Oh, okay. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Statecraft is Soulcraft, George sure. Will's book from the eighties. Yeah. Uh, for Americans, of course, another great Burke text, which all kids in, in middle and high school used to read and even know is his speech on conciliation with the colonies. Yeah, that's a great um, that's sort of Burke's applied thought to the question of the American Revolution. Great, great speech. That's awesome. That's yeah, that's a it's a good one that more people ought to read. Well, thanks for your question, Christina. And for our listeners, if you'd like to submit a question for the next episode, just shoot us a DM on Twitter or leave your question in a review of the show. Now for our books of the week, Dr. Sakanga, what are you reading right now? I'm I'm reading this right here, the autobiography of Calvin Coolidge, <laughs> ISI. Um, <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Um, I, I've forgotten what a treasure Calvin yeah. Coolidge is in his mind, his thinking, his writing. It's just a joy to read. Uh, particularly if you like dry humor. (laughs) (laughs) People think he was silent. I think he was just sarcastic. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. No, that's for sure. Have you ever heard um, Amity Schles tell the story about the the farm veto, farm bill veto? It's a great story. Tell it. Yeah, she says... You know, they, they bring the, the farm bill to him and um, and he says and everyone obviously expected him to be supportive of this because he's from a farming and agricultural area. And he says, 
the way that Amity says it is so great. So I'm not going to do it full justice, but she says, you know, don't suppose farmers make much money. Don't suppose they ever will farm veto. (laughs) 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 It's just like, you know, you wouldn't expect that out of Calvin Coolidge, but, uh, but he certainly had that sort of, uh, punchy, uh, witty dryness to him. Marlo, what are you reading right now? Well, on the note of aesthetics and art, I am reading Hot, Cold, Heavy Light by Peter Sheljal, who I hope I'm pronouncing his last name correctly, um, but it includes 100 of his writings from a 30-year period between 1988 and 2018. So um, Sheljal is the longtime art critic of The New Yorker, and I've just been trying to pick up language to better express how I talk about art, and I just want to better acclimate myself to contemporary art since I'm going to soon live closer to the Philadelphia area and want to make the most of the scene out there and be able to speak intelligently about it at museums and things like that. So um, yeah, I picked up his book. It's a National Book Critics Circle Award finalist. So I figured that the um, that it would be well worth, worth my time. That's awesome. That sounds like a interesting read. <laughs> what about you, James? Yeah, I'm uh, I'm well, I'm reading Abolition of Man right now in preparation for um, our upcoming episode with Father Michael Ward on his new uh, guide to Abolition of Man called uh, After Humanity. Um, and I'll soon be reading After Humanity. Um, but uh, and still, you know, I think that I've had a couple people in the office pick on me for this, but uh, still reading through Natural Right and History and uh, Machiavelli's Prince, just trying to do it slowly. Um, because, uh, you know, that's how Strauss would have wanted it. So (laughs) it was his birthday recently. So, yeah, well, those are, those are dense texts that kind of deserve a very thorough treatment. So they take a while to get through. (laughs) Indeed. Indeed. Uh, Before we get to our interview, I'd like to thank you for listening to conservative conversations. This podcast is a production of the intercollegiate studies Institute. Our mission at ISI is to educate for Liberty. If you would like to help us in that mission, please rate and review a podcast on Apple podcasts to help us reach more listeners like yourself. So, Jeff, it's the beginning of the school year for students all over the country and faculty all over the country. And today we want to talk a little bit about teaching American history. Perhaps we could start by uh, speaking a little bit about your recent op-ed in USA Today titled, Whether Students Are Zooming in, uh, Zooming or in Classrooms, They Need to Learn American History. Talk to us a little bit about the state of teaching American history today in the United States and of civics courses in general. Yeah, I mean, there's been so much controversy about how kids are going to learn point I wanted to make in that piece was we really need to be concerned about what they're learning. And to some extent, that's been overshadowed, although it's been brought back to the fore with things like the 1619 Project and critical race theory in schools and the debate over that. Um, We've had for 40 years, more than that now, 45, 50 years, a long, slow, and now accelerating decline in civic literacy among young people. That is just directly connected to a decline in the teaching uh, of traditional American history and government, um, both in the quantity that's being taught, um, less and less of it is being taught, but also in the quality and in the way it's being taught. A movement uh, away from primary documents toward textbooks, which every student knows. I have a 16-year-old son who will tell me over and over again how boring or biased the textbooks are. And it's always true. People can remember it themselves uh, when they were in school. And it, but it's just that trend has just accelerated and now become politicized in this very negative way in the last two, three years, which is really just the things poking through the surface that was that's been coming for a long time with Howard Zinn way back in the 19 early 1980s. So but now we're seeing the fruits of that. And it's really kind of a perfect storm of all of those causes coming together to what is, I think people have rightly called a civic education crisis. Obviously, you know, this is probably a civic education crisis that transcends both into, you know, it's probably high school and also college. I'm sure that that issue is also dominant on college campuses, but um, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on just how young Americans can even appreciate American history and core principles when there's not really a shared American identity young people can rally around. And when a lot of young people look at their futures with such uncertainty and apprehension, and I'm sure COVID really exacerbated that, um, not to mention, you know, an epidemic of loneliness among many young people that kind of um, kind of prohibits that sense of commonality um, and uh, and community. So how do you even teach college age students to appreciate appreciate American history when that glue of a shared identity and pride is missing? And when the story of America that you mention has lost its luster in the eyes of, of these generations? 
Yeah, that's a that's a really hard endeavor. And that is that is where we are. There's no question that's true. Um, I think you have to go back to the sources themselves, to the original documents. Uh, I think I think actually if you go back to those and just start naively with a conversation, let's just start reading the Declaration of Independence and say, what does this mean? Let's just do it that way together. Um, I think you can actually build a shared story and a shared identity out of those conversations. It takes longer. And that's definitely, there's no question that's eroded and in fact been fractured, um, sometimes by inattention and sometimes deliberately. But I think the way back is to go back to the sources themselves and to engage in those conversations with each other, but frankly, also with those great minds from the past and be in conversation with them in that way and build really from the bottom up. There are a few statistics in your piece that were particularly alarming. You say only, uh, or you, you cite a couple of polls, and one of them says only 24% of students performed at or above the proficient level in civics, and 15% exhibited satisfactory knowledge and understanding of American history. And then you say as well that uh, a quarter of young adults, 26%, say there are, uh, they are extremely proud to be American. I mean, that's really low. That is, I think that people are underestimating how bad it really is as far as people just understanding their own country or even loving their own country. Yeah. And I, I think it's particularly, what's particularly telling is the, the gap between young people. There used to be a very small gap in the affection that citizens had for their country based on age. The difference between older people and younger people wasn't very much. Now the gap is very wide. People who had an uh, older people who had a more traditional American history and government education uh, are, have affection for the country at, at a much higher level than the number that you cited there. What is it, twenty six percent? Well, you know, w- one thing this is making me think of is, you know, you're sort of saying that this is this is a result of poor civics education. So I wonder if you can map a little bit for us what's the purpose of civics education. You know, why is it important? Because I could imagine some people saying it's just not important. That's why we don't do it anymore. Um, which is, you know, a shame, but you know, what's your case for why civics education, why teaching American history? Well, why does that matter? Um, the future of self-government depends on it. I I really think civic education is education for self-government. Um, you can't know, you can't understand the greatness of the achievement of the American Republic and the experiment in self-government, unless you know something of the history of it and the tradition out of which it comes, you can't understand, um, why it's the right thing, why a regime of individual liberty and personal responsibility and civic virtue is the right way to live unless you understand the principles. And, you you know, the thing about American patriotism is, uh, Tocqueville talks about this in Democracy in America, he calls it reflective patriotism, that people should love their country because they understand why it's lovable. And that means that every generation has to recover that understanding. It's not, Reagan said it in his farewell address, right? It's not passed down in the blood. Every generation has to relearn it. And we've been thinking that what we need is, you know, a lot more STEM and a lot less history. And you can just chart the differences in amount of time in schools, look at colleges and the number of majors. History majors have dropped precipitously. Uh, in the last few years, in the last 10 years, and STEM majors have gone up. Uh, nothing wrong with having good engineers and scientists, of course, but uh, as I always tell the students here, it's you need to know math, you need to have basic scientific literacy, of course you do, and fundamental texts of, of uh, science that introduce you to the great questions. There's no question that's true, but you're not necessarily going to be a scientist or a mathematician your whole life, but you are going to be a citizen your whole life. And this country only works if the citizens are healthy. I want to, especially since ISI has a lot of students interested in history that are even studying it as a major, these students sometimes express concern about whether their chosen path of study can lead to lucrative careers or at the very least careers with some sort of security. And as you just mentioned, it's it's not just a matter of, um, you know, taking up history as a field of study for um for you know, having that security, that job security, but it's also just a path to self-governance and something that every student should um, be able to achieve some level of literacy in. Um, do you have any advice for students who are particularly interested in pursuing history as uh, as a career, whether it's in academia or they just have a really um, 
you know, the, the, this significant interest in it because maybe they have insight into the benefits that drawing from history and learning about it can help them in um, in being good citizens and appreciating um, some of the achievements of, of American history. I mean, the, the, I think the study of history deepens you as a human being profoundly, you really realize that there sometimes there really is nothing new under the sun <laughs> and that you really can, the wisdom of, of, uh, of our ancestors uh, speaks to us still. There's no question about that. And of course, connects us to something larger than ourselves. And we see ourselves as part of, of, of a much larger sort of chain of being almost, right? Connecting back to the past and to the future. Um, the kind of thing I've been Burke talked about. So we see that and it, it, it elevates us as human beings. But, you know, it's also true that um, people like Winston Churchill said was absolutely clear on this in his writings. If you're going to be a person in a position of leadership, the most important quality you can possibly have is good judgment, courage and good judgment. <laughs> but you have to have good judgment. And the farther anybody goes along in their career, you know, students should ask their parents, grandparents, um, the, far, the farther you go in your career, the more you rise up in an organization, the more important, the less important technical knowledge is, and the more important good judgment is. And good judgment makes or breaks companies. It makes or breaks businesses. It makes or breaks families. It makes or breaks communities. It makes or breaks countries. It wins wars or it loses wars. Good judgment really matters. And you can learn a lot. <laughs> about and acquire the quality of good judgment by studying history. Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, one of the one of the lines in the piece that I thought was uh, spot on, and I would love to hear more about, um, and I think a lot of our students would be interested in this as well. You write, uh, first, we needed to devote more time in school to helping students learn not only the facts of American history and government, but also the story of it. I wonder... You know, why does, why do sort of, why are narrative history is so important, right? Like you think about Bill, uh, Bill McClay's new book, Land of Hope, or, you know, John Lukash is a great narrative historian as well and an ISI man. Why, why is that sort of history important versus just the sort of details and points and dates uh, kind of history? Nobody cares about facts unless they know why they should care about them. Then it's just if to just learn facts in the way that a lot of so, um, AP US history students who have been in that, they know that very often that is just a memorization exercise. And you, you have, you know, DBQs and prompts and all that kind of stuff. And you just learn the stuff so that you take the test. You either, you have to come to a, you have to have a love of history before you get to a class like that, or it will drive the love out of you. It will certainly never kindle it in you. Um, really true. Aristotle says, uh, in the beginning of the metaphysics, uh, human beings by nature desire to know. And by that, he means that we want to understand the why of things. We want to an understand the purposes and principles of things. That's a very human desire and a, a, and a high and elevated human desire. When people understand the story of America, they understand, they start to see its principles and purposes lived out in, in the lives of people. That's what makes a great story. That's why people, that's why, you know, people read Tolkien because they see it's not just characters and facts and things happening, but there's this arc and this purpose to things laying it out. And it's in inherently compelling. And history used to be taught like that unashamedly. And now, of course, it's deconstructed and it precisely pulled away from that. And I, and I think, therefore, if you tell kids you, this this is a fundamentally ugly and uninteresting thing you're studying, but you have to learn the facts of it. Of course, they don't care. And that's unfortunately where too much history instruction, both in college and high school is right now. Yeah, no, I, I just wanted to follow up. I mean, obviously, critical race theory has been something that has been in the news. It's very sensational right now. It's it, it's been discovered in um, in you know, higher education, absolutely, but also in like primary schools where young children are, uh, you know, these these developing minds are being exposed to what many historians have debunked as um, a revisionist account of history. And uh, one that is, I mean, it obviously we can, we can teach history in a way that does not whitewash the events of the past, but critical race theory doesn't really seek to do that. It's, it's giving something else that um, historians have debunked as being outright falsehoods. So how would you say um, 
critical race theory poses a threat to the study of history? Um, and how do, how do historians and professors who teach history and students who want to study history approach that study with the notion, and perhaps these are students um, in ISI and other um, truth-seeking organizations, uh, how should they approach that study when it might be tarnished in, in universities and schools? Yeah, I mean, that's ooh, that's a hard one, too. Um, studying, if you accept the premises of CRT, there's no reason to study history. There's no reason that's edifying. All it will do will is embitter you. All it will do is create despair in you. All it will do is think that you're locked into systems of oppression, either you're the oppressed or the oppressor, but it's all a system of oppression from which there really is no escape. Um, that who wants to do that with their time in life? Um, it's not it's definitely not young people who, who want something higher and better and nobler than that. Um, and it's not the way that great Americans, you know, like Frederick Douglass, who I think is a truly great American, um, it's not the way he looked at American history. I mean, he lived it. He lived slavery, but he didn't think that America was therefore a system of oppression. He didn't whitewash the bad, of course. He was a fierce critic of the bad, but he always saw the bad in light of the good, not the good in light of the bad. And that gives you optimism and hope. And so I would say to those students, read, read, read the biographies of people like that, of great Americans like that, who... Un, you know, they weren't blinded, they weren't naive, they weren't blinkered, um, but they saw the truth, but they saw deeper than the surface to the reality and core of America and its traditions of self-government and liberty, you know, ordered liberty and all the rest that, that do provide hope and inspiration for everybody. So I would say, you know, <laughs> go to those things. And the good news is people are still writing popular histories like that. And there's a lot of good ones and there's a lot of old ones that are good and they should find those, not the contemporary. St there's still good contemporary historians. You mentioned Bill McClay. He's a great contemporary historian and there are still good ones out there, but they ought to go to those. And here's the interesting thing. Those popular historical biographies, you can think of the success of the musical Hamilton, um, which is not CRT infused. They sell because they're naturally interesting and engaging and enlivening and make you think and again, cultivate judgment in you. And they're just, it's so fascinating to get to know these in really interesting human beings who show us fully what possibilities are there for us as human beings in our condition. So I would say, go to those books, read those books, whether they're new or especially if they're old. What are what are some of the older like narrative histories in the United States that you would recommend? Obviously, we mentioned Bill's uh, newer book, but what are some of the older ones that you'd recommend? You know, you could go all the way back to the American Revolution. Uh, Mercy Otis Warren and her work on the American Revolution is terrific. Biography, Lord Charnwood's biography of Abraham Lincoln is fantastic. And, and it, it, it's old fashioned in the best sense of the word. Because they're, they're always looking at those histories as opportunities to kind of illustrate um, a moral quality or illustrate a, a, a difficult decision that a statesman had to make. Those are the things that are inherently interesting and riveting. So there's, there's just two right there. There's a lot of them. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to you know, send a list and, and you, can, you can send it out to your listeners if they're interested. But there's just a couple, but there's so many good ones. Do you have any recommendations for um, literature that perhaps is fiction that provides insight into the American story that can really um, inspire students interested in maybe perhaps not just biographies, but, um, you know, just literature that highlights just American history, some of the challenges that the writer and his his or her contemporaries faced at the um, at that time of the writing or um, you know, whether that's Hemingway or Kerouac, do you have any ideas in mind of how um, students interested in English and language arts can also access that American story? Yeah, that's a, another, that's a great, uh, we shouldn't, we should never neglect history, understanding history through literature, right? Yeah. James Fenimore Cooper, I would recommend. I don't think he's read as much as nearly to these days as he should. And I'm always shocked by the fact that students will study pivotal moments in American history, like the Civil War, 
and I'll ask them, so you, you've read Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe, right? And they all say, uh, no, never. Uh, that is one of the truly most important novels of, in American history and, and a great read and really important uh, and will forever disabuse you of using the term Uncle Tom derisively because he's the hero of that story and truly great character. So that, that'd, be just, that'd be a couple right there that I'd recommend. So, you know, we're thinking a little bit about what sort of books people should be reading. And obviously, you, you know, you teach at, uh, at uh, the Ashbrook's or, you know, at Ashbrook University or the Ashbrook Center um, or Ashland University, excuse me. And, you know, Robbie, I was, I was on Twitter the other day and I saw Robbie George had this very interesting thread about teaching um, where he says, number one, remember, the professor's job is not to get students to believe as he or she does. We should not be telling students what to think. Our mission is to inspire and empower our students to think more deeply, more critically, including self-critically, and, f- and most importantly, he sort of emphasizes for themselves. He says, if you teach com- controversial s- uh, subjects, look at your syllabus. Can you honestly say you're providing students with the best arguments on both or all sides of the issues? Um, and he goes on, but you know, this is uh, sort of controversial. Some people, uh, some people certainly disagreed with him um, and thought that no, you you know, you should. Um, sort of teach from a perspective and uh, te- in some instances uh, it's, it's not necessarily good to have that, that total openness to all sides of all arguments. How do you approach that question? How do you think about what the role of the teacher is in teaching history? Is the, is the job to have the 1619 project and the 1776 commission on the same sort of thing? You know, how do, how do you approach that? Um, I, I work at an institution that has trademarked teaching students uh, not uh, teaching students not what to think, but how to think. So I, I completely agree with Professor George's sentiment there. Absolutely. You know, I wouldn't do either one of those two things. I wouldn't put 1619 next to 1776. What I'd do is say, why don't we just read Frederick Douglass? Why don't we just read John C. Calhoun? Why don't we just read Lincoln? Why don't we just read Jefferson and Hamilton and put them next to each other? We can frame the question that we're trying to investigate. But I say, go back to the original sources themselves. And the great thing about the American political tradition is we have a lot of that already. If you wanna understand the constitution, we can read Madison's notes. We can read the constitutional text. We can read the ratification debates. We can read the Federalist Papers. We can read all of that for ourselves and think those things through. And that's, I think, the really great news about American history and, and government. We can do it ourselves. And so I say, put the textbooks aside, put the curriculums aside and get into the text themselves. Or if you have a great textbook like Bill McClay's book, it will point you to those sources themselves for further discussion. That's the kind of thing that we ought to be doing. Yeah. I mean, I think that that, that is, I, that was one of the things I also found interesting about your, your USA Today piece was the emphasis on primary sources. And I know when I've talked to, uh, one of your one of your teachers there, uh, Cara Rogers, who teaches at the ISI Honors Program, um, she's brought up this emphasis to me as well. And I was, I'm interested, um, what uh, is there a sort of who are the influences who led that led the Ashbrook Center to have this sort of emphasis? Was this um, uh, was, did this come out of another particular maybe crisis of uh, civics education, or um, is this a particular sort of style of of uh, teaching and thinking about American history? Yeah, I mean, it, it comes out of the sort of the mind uh, behind the Ashbrook Center's approach to academic things. It's really Peter Schramm, who was the executive director here. He was a student out at Claremont. And so he sort of discovered through his teacher, Harry Jaffa, the importance of studying the texts themselves. I don't think he always agreed with Harry Jaffa. Nobody ever agreed with Harry Jaffa exactly, but but agreed on the idea of returning to the sources themselves. My own teacher, Jim Caesar at the University of Virginia, uh, first class I ever had where we actually read books, the books themselves, and, and had conversations about those. So, um, yeah, I mean, we, we come, from, uh, come out of traditions, uh, various traditions coming out of that, uh, including Cara's own background in reading texts. And we, the good news is that, you know, we can agree on what texts are important and what texts are really helpful for students and what they ought to read. And those texts start, you know, go back to the canons of Western civilization and move forward. And, and it's, uh, we don't always agree on the interpretation of those texts or the meaning of them or particular political opinions, but at least we have a foundation from which we can have a real discussion. Yeah. 
what I wonder if I could I know we've asked for a couple of lists from you today. I apologize. But um <laughs> I wonder if I could add one more and ask what are some sort of, what are I mean obviously you have the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States. But outside of that, what um outside of those two and maybe let me knock off the Federalist papers as well cuz that's too easy. But um outside of those three, what would you say maybe maybe just th- 3 to 5 sort of if you are an American citizen, you need to read these speeches or documents. Or Gettysburg Address, uh, and probably Lincoln's second inaugural. I think you ought to read Calvin Coolidge's speech on the 150th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. I think you should read some Woodrow Wilson to get the other side. He's not as interesting a writer as Coolidge, but all right. We always have here, uh, our seniors have a senior capstone class where we start with the first word of Tocqueville's Democracy in America and read all the way through to the last word. That's amazing. Yeah, it's a great experience. Wow. Um, so it's so rich, as everybody knows who studied Tocqueville. And uh, so I would say Tocqueville, for sure, ought to be read. Uh, that's four or five right there. And then, you know, contemporary things like, uh, I think to understand contemporary politics, and the contemporary sort of society and the world we find ourselves in to read um, LBJ's great society speech and pair that up with Ronald Reagan's time for choosing. And I think you can really get a sense of con- the contemporary political landscape. That is a very interesting list. You, I, two of them I expected. I expected Gettysburg Address and Second Inaugural because those are obviously you know, hugely important speeches in American history. But I didn't expect Woodrow Wilson or LBJ. Those were surprises. So thank you for that. Yeah, I actually, um, I I did the Claremont Publius Fellowship this summer. And something that I actually benefited from a lot was reading uh, Woodrow Wilson on progressivism and then reading um, statements by student activists in the 60s and um, some of these more radical accounts of how they were going to fight against, um, obviously there was the the Vietnam War was happening. There were also the the Civil Rights Act or the Civil Rights Movements and um, the uh, sexual revolution, things like that. And uh, that benefited me immensely. Also reading, you know, LBJ, I, I really took, it allowed me to have a thorough treatment of um, this century uh, that I wouldn't have otherwise and allowed me to better appreciate um, a lot of the other um, historical biographies and accounts that I did read from um, some of the founding fathers and things like that. So um, I guess that kind of, I, I want to ask this question is, Whenever we obviously right now and you teach college students, so you're probably even more aware of this than I am, but students, we just, you know, it was the 20th um, anniversary of the tragedy that was 9-11. And nowadays students, some of them uh, weren't even alive when 9-11 happened. So how do we make sure that students have, when we're just looking at history and we want to teach history accurately and have um, some sort of identifying feature so that students have the ability to see themselves and see their potential, as you mentioned earlier, in these historical figures. What are some crucial touchstones that you think um, are essential for history professors to um, allow students to engage in uh, materials that come from, you know, perhaps people who died 250 years ago or were alive 250 years ago? Are there any figures that come to mind? Ooh, fig- figures for the students themselves to study? Yes. Oh, boy. Um... You know, we we'll, we sometimes will even have an entire semester class just on George Washington or just on James Madison or to get a full rounded picture of the human being. You know, it's very easy to either say, well, Thomas Jefferson owned their slaves, therefore I don't want to talk to Thomas Jefferson or Tom in the olden, olden days, it was Thomas Jefferson never did anything wrong. Therefore, Thomas Jefferson um, to get a full rounded picture of them as human beings, as statesmen, as practical politicians. So, uh, you know, I I would say, and the good news is on the last four decades, scholars have really put together tremendous collections so that if you wanted to get to know the mind and person of Thomas Jefferson, there's so much good, uh, so many good collected works out there of Jefferson that you could put it together. You can find it online. um, You you can buy it. So it's relatively inexpensive for students. I, I think to take some time to get to know an individual statesman or thinker or poet or, you know, who who, the the thing that you're passionate about that the student wants to know more about um, and to go back and find one of those from 100 or 200 or 300 years ago. 
And to get to know that one mind really well, that's such a wonderful experience. And it's, it's such a deep experience. Um, we All our students here in the Ashbrook Scholar Program do a senior thesis. And we tell them, you, you really can't do more than two people. Everybody, they're always ambitious and want to do a whole history of the world kind of thing, right? You know, or every one of Burke's works or something, you know, something like that. It's impossible. You can't do it. Focus on one thinker or one statesman or one, human, you know, important event and di di dig deep into that. And I think a lot of college education that students have skims over the top of a lot of stuff and doesn't give them the time to dig deep. And I just say, if you, if you can't find it in your own education, where at an institution, make it for yourself and get the chance to just say, who's the most interesting person I've met from the past? I want to get to know them really well. It will completely change um, how you think about the world. Yeah, I'd love to ask you a little bit about the Ashbrook Scholars Program as well as um, the master's program I've heard so much about for uh, high school teachers. Um, so, you know, if, if, uh, if we have alumni who are, you know, getting ready to send their kids off to college, sort of what, what, might, that ki what might that student expect in a, um, at the Ashbrook uh, Scholars Program? And then after that, if you tell us a little bit about that master's program, I'd love to hear more. Sure. So the Ashbrook Scholar Program is a is a four year undergraduate program, residential program that happens at Ashland University, where the Ashbrook Center is located. Um, it's really an honors program for students who are really interested in politics, in history, and political economy, but they want to approach it from the tradition of liberal education, uh, and we root everything in sort of the, the 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 fundamental questions of the human condition: what's justice, what's friendship. Um, you know, it, it, liberty, what's freedom, Th those kinds of big questions. And then we just sit down together in seminar conversations and read great texts that address those issues and spend four years just talking with each other and thinking the, those things through. Uh, and it's, it's a wonderful program. I've been doing it for, I, it, I wish it's the education I had. Yeah. Yeah. Can I follow up on that quick and ask, you know, uh, I, I, a lot of, a lot of folks in the conservative education world, you know, I went to the Templeton Honors College. This was a priority there. You know, it's priority at St. John's priority at University of Dallas, the seminar, right? The model of, of sitting around a, a table together or a hollow square together and discussing a text versus a sort of traditional lecture. I wonder if you could, uh, if you have any comments on why you think that that is, uh, the best model for sort of undergraduate education. Because education is ultimately not about information. And it's definitely not about indoctrination, for sure. Unfortunately, it has become that, but in its essence, it's not. It's about thinking and discovery of the truth and pursuing the truth and discovering it. And I think that that happens by conversation. Everybody who has, has had that experience in one way or another, having a great conversation with a friend, and suddenly you, you realize something you didn't think before and didn't know before has kind of had those moments, sort of the moments that people had with Socrates in the Platonic dialogues, right? Um, those, I just don't think you can get that in a lecture. You can get information off a of PowerPoint. And some of that information is pretty interesting stuff, but it doesn't change who you are. It doesn't make you think new thoughts. And I think education is fundamentally about discovering the truth by thinking through conversation. And I just think you have to have a physical place we're having a great conversation now online, but it, to sustain that conversation over time, you need to, as one of my teachers used to say, don't teach and you don't teach until you can see the whites of their eyes. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's personal. It's intimate, this kind of education and, and people come into it one way and they leave changed and hopefully better people. You're, you're making me think of a, I, I referenced the episode we did with RJ Snell, I feel like on every podcast episode we do, but I thought it was a really, I thought he had some really wonderful comments. And in that episode, he talked about um, the idea of the, the real roots of the word conspiracy, to conspire, right, to breathe with one another. Um, and I think that that's such an important idea in education. And it's something we definitely value um, at places like the ISI Honors Program. It's a, it's a priority for us. And we try to do that same thing in our master's program that you asked about. Yeah, I mean, we we bring in teachers from around the country, American history and government teachers, and for week-long intensive classes, and we just sit down and break bread together in that hollow square, 
and say, let's read Woodrow Wilson and Calvin Coolidge and understand this debate about progressivism in the early 20th century. Let's read, you know, uh, Abraham Lincoln and Stephen Douglas and understand the arguments at the time of the Civil War. Uh, that's we approach it the same way. Um, it's designed for them. And I've, I teach in it, too. I teach class usually on the Constitution or the Supreme Court. And I've just seen teachers come away from it with new confidence in their ability to that they really get this and they can teach this and come away with a kind of um, transformed understanding of what they should be doing as teachers, which is they come to realize that the best teaching is teaching that causes the students to think, not put stuff in their head. And they, they see that, they experience that, and they, we hope, and they, we know that they do from their testimony, they bring it back to their own classrooms. That's really wonderful. That's, it's good to hear. You know, we need more programs like that that are training the people who teach, teach our young people and, you know, are raising the next generation of citizens. The way we put it is we try to reach the young through those who teach the young. There you go. Well, fresh second guy, I'd love to ask you the question we ask all of our guests, um, which is, uh, what is conservatism? I think it's not an ism. Oh, there we go. This is the first answer that's ever said that. Ex explain that more. Um, by that, I mean, it's not an ideology. Uh, it's not a systematic set of totally coherent um, a priori principles. That's not conservatism. Uh, conservatism is a disposition uh, of gratitude, first and foremost, right? The conservative always thinks about, is always amazed uh, at the miracle of the, the goodness that's in the world and thinks the first task is not to change the world, but to preserve the good that's in the world and recognizes how fragile in many ways that good is. So I think it's a disposition of gratitude for the good that's in the world. I think it's a disposition to um, want to do the most good and be the most good one can be, relying and not simply on oneself, but knowing one's connections to all the things that make that possible. Um, so I don't think it's an ism. I think it's a disposition. That, and therefore, conservatives often do, as we all know, end up disagreeing with each other on all kinds of policy issues. Absolutely. Some, sometimes <laughs> it seems like there is no such thing as conservatism because of that. But that's <laughs> not true. <laughs> you can yeah. hold a lot of different policy positions. But uh, I think in the American context, for sure, conservatism is also a disposition towards self-government. Yeah. Government of oneself as an individual, government of one's family, one's community, and one's nation. And a recognition of the, the difficulty, but also the nobility of self-government. Yeah, I think it was uh, Roger Scruton who um, said that conservatism is an instinct, and I, I like how you describe it as an, as a disposition, not necessarily not an ideology. But Jeff, thank you so much for joining us today. If people are interested in seeing more of your work or following you, where can they find you? Um, take a look at Ashbrook.org. That's our website. We've got all kinds of resources there. And some of my writings are up there as well as lots of other faculty and, and uh, just a great understanding of what we do around the country for students, teachers, and citizens. Well, thank you again so much for being with us, Jeff. And, uh, you know, upcoming on Conservative Conversations, be on the lookout for episodes with Father Michael Ward on C.S. Lewis and with Nate Hotchman on Gen Z Conservatism. Thank you for listening to Conservative Conversations with ISI. If you have enjoyed this podcast, please feel free to head over to isi.org slash resources to see all of the other resources we offer our members, including the Intercollegiate Review, Select Modern Age Articles, ISI Books, and of course, this podcast. Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to rate and review, and we will see you next time on Conservative Conversations with ISI. Bye.